What the hell? Oh, we're live. <laughs> Aloha, Kako. We are live tonight, oh. and it's one of those kind of days. Nah. <laughs> nah, it's actually been a great day, and we're so happy tonight to have um, Laura Klenacasio with us. She's joining us again. Um, it's really awesome because she first joined us just like at the first, I think the first week or so of being nominated to be Hilo's, um, to represent Hilo in the state ledge. Appointed. Appointed, call mine, appointed. Hello. Yes, so now it's been some months and it I'm sure has been such a whirlwind and um, we'd love to hear about these last few months and what you've experienced and learned and all the, wow. I can't wait to hear this stories of yeah. what um, the last few months of your life have been like. Mahalo yeah. so much for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's beautiful to see you both today. Um, it, it's also, yeah, we've had a really wonderful day. It, it was a wild, wild session, I have to say. Most people ask me, how's it going? And that's the only, you know, that's the word that kind of comes to my mind immediately is it, it's just wild. Um, and Kind of, I say that in a, in a sense of wild, like crazy wild and also wild, like I've learned so much. Um, I think I, you know, yeah, there's just, there's just a lot. And so I'm trying to think like where to start actually, because um, when I did um, speak with you folks last, I feel like it was just like a week or two into session. I had just hired staff and we came on, um, we came on, hit the ground running. Mm -hmm. And um, that's one thing I'm gonna have to say is that I, I ended up having the most incredible staff that really allowed me to, to learn and engage 100%, 110%, 15 20% in, in all of the, you know, the learning curve, of course, that was, was really steep. Um, <laughs> I met so many amazing I've met that's this is the one thing about this position so far within the Senate staff um, within the Capitol met so many incredible people um, who have a lot many of which have become really incredible mentors and and even and same thing within the community because of the 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 interface and the need to engage with community members on so many different levels I'm just always always amazed at the the level of um, knowledge and magnitude of folks in our community who are doing incredible things. Um, yeah, so we, we just, um, you know, you learn, you come in, I came in last minute um, and started learning kind of like in general, what the, what some of the generalized um, kind of, I would say grooming in terms of what a Senator is and, and what are the lessons to be learned kind of quickly. And one of which um, I'm going to, I'm going to go through a list, which I kind of, I, I tend to tell most people. One was don't read the bills. And this is not from everyone, by the way. So my mentors um, that I've been working with this is not coming from them, but just kind of a much more generalized thing of like what I pick up from people in terms of comments and, and, and conversations here and there and one, one or even direct advice from some. Don't read the bills, um, make friends with everyone. Don't vote no on people's bills because they take it personal. And then of course they won't vote on your bills um, there's, wow. there's, a, there's a few others, um, you know, you definitely, uh, you want to stay in the favor of, of folks that, um, that have control of, of money and, and what's shared with your community in terms of finances. And, um, the other big one is when you're writing bills and submitting them, definitely don't, um, don't have broad titles for your bills. And, um, so taking steps back, you know, uh, immediately I'm thinking, don't read the bills. This is horrible. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, to like, me, that's my main purpose for being there is to read the bills <laughs> and to try to understand them. Not only that, but try to find the intricacies of things beyond the words that are there 
um, to see like what are the deeper implications and maybe even some kind of, you know, um, yeah, well, yeah, no, that's my job is to read the bills. Um, there were um, situations where I was asked to sign on to bills and, um, and not read them just, and I was, um, I was kind of, you know, had a, I would say a little bit of grief from, from the part, you know, the party on the behalf of not just signing it. And I'm thinking, well, I don't know what's in that bill. I don't want to sign on to that bill. Um, it's kind of suspicious too. It's like, close your eyes and sign here. Uh -huh. Like, it seems kind of like they're trying to sneak. Yeah. Like, Again, not everybody. Is, yeah, I'm, I'm going to just re rephrase it. Not everyone is like that. Not everything, but just like a general vibe. Um, and those kinds of things, I think, sometimes stand out more so even than um, folks that are, are um, not professing that or not participating in that kind of um, leadership. Um, or I don't, I wouldn't necessarily call that leadership, but, you know, just kind of like, and again, it, it aligns with things of, of learning what is politics and what is leadership and, and, mm -hmm. and the different nuances within that, which I'm, I'm navigating myself. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the make friends with everyone is interesting because we also, um, we, we had an opportunity to meet Nina Turner. Um, she's running for, um, I believe, Congress in uh, Ohio on a special election and she's wonderful, but she was basically, she was like, we're not here to make friends. And I could really relate to that in the sense that I love friends, I want more friends, but if it comes at a cost of um, jeopardizing integrity or right. doing something that is non-transparent or what have you, it's, that's not a friend. So mm -hmm. even though, of course, it becomes this, this wonderful dance of trying to figure out, you know, uh, I guess legitimacy and, and such is, is really building trust. So that's been a wonderful thing is to actually have relations and build trust with a lot of my colleagues that, um, that do feel like they're lasting. And uh, that's been a beautiful part. So, so while I do love friends and I'm, I'm definitely interested in collaborating and, and building those relationships with, with many folks, um, and, and I have, and I, and I look forward to that continuing. Um, I'm definitely um, the make friends with everyone um, what I'm taking that to mean, even though I think it may not be what was meant, is we can collaborate. We can be, we can have different opinions. We can have different views on things and still sit down and talk about a bill and maybe try to even figure out ways to make it work for all or even just hear someone out in terms of their experience and, and then uh, communicate with them so they can hear, my, hear me out in terms of what either myself or my constituents um, are bringing up when it comes to a certain bill, that I, I absolutely um, can fall in line with in terms of making friends. But making friends just to make friends is, is like a, right. it, um, feels much more like a, a, a popularity contest. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, or the so. outcome is more about your own career growth, not necessarily the integrity of what you're trying to do. Right. So like, I, but I understand that too, like the nature of, the legislative body is like awesome. compromise is the key. So I, you know, I can see that, but I, I appreciate that yeah. like friendship in your own personal relationships isn't the first priority. Right. And that goes into the next one, which is don't vote no on people's bills because they take it personal. And I feel like, wow. Okay. So if a bill is really um, speaking to my community in a way that uh, I can't vote for it, then I'm sitting here with this, you know, conflict of, okay, my community is telling, or, you know, those who I, I'm hearing from in my community are saying one thing, but, oh, this person, and am I going to lose favor with them or whatever it may be, right? And so then it again becomes about something that's different than what the content of the bill is. And so for me, it just goes back to, uh, I apologize, I have to vote no on your bill, but it's not about you. Right, it's not personal. It's about the language in the bill, or it's about unintended consequences, or it's about a lot of times certain things um, may be really important for for Oahu too, but not necessarily for um, on outer islands, right? So that's a perspective that I always will have to bring because I represent Hilo, not you know downtown or something. So um, those things might be very different, and and to say to speak that and feel um, very you know convicted about it 
with with pride and and say it's not about you it just doesn't relate to my community you know and, and those kinds of things so you know there's there's deeper explorations with a lot of that but that's kind of one thing and and the other piece that I mentioned, which was don't use broad titles is really interesting. And it, I'll bring up a specific bill called 862, which uh, became a law, um, although it was on governor's veto list and then it was overridden by the, by the um, Senate, by the actually both houses. Um, 862 started out as a one line bill and the title was relating to state government which means could be anything, right? And it was a one-line bill that was to abolish the Office of Aerospace. Okay, that's it. And overnight, well, I started getting texts from, from constituents. What's happening? What is up with 862? And constituents that I highly respect in, in terms of, you know, following things and their, um, their value system and, and such. I, I don't know. I, it's not. It wasn't in my committee, so I, I, I didn't. It, I didn't come across it yet, even though I'll vote on it on the floor. So I go look it up, and it had morphed into 58 pages. Um, this is maybe two days before our final vote. Palala. Palala is right. And the part that started stirring up, I think, attention within our community, especially within. Um, uh, you know, because it, it took away a lot of the language in HTA that protected culture and environmental things. And that made red flags go off. So a lot of people started sending in testimony. And then of course, in the last hearing, uh, in a, maybe it was in conference committee or it could have been in the very last, um, last hearing, um, that part was um, removed or, or put back in actually to the language of HTA, but then there was it, there was about at least eight different subject matters within this one bill. But normally, it's you can't do that with Senate policy. It has to be the same subject matter. But because it's under the title of state government, it all related to state government. So it technically was under that title. So wow! This one and been, then when it goes in committee, anybody can amend and that into the, inside the committee. Mm -hmm. And so then you had people giving testimony like, I'm in support of this bill except section three, or, or they would say, um, I have no problem with the rest of this bill, but section two, and, and then they address just that section because that's what is pertinent to them. And so then as a, as a lawmaker, for me, it makes it very difficult to make a decision because you might have one thing that you you're, would really benefit your community. And then the other thing that is horrible for the community, but it's in the same bill, and so for me, I just voted no on it for a number of reasons, but one just on principle of transparency and that um, in terms of my understanding of democracy and our, our government, that that's just not really appropriate. Um, you know, and then it's, it was posed that there's, good, there's really necessary times for those kinds of things. Like if you need something to be done last minute and it's, it's to your, and it, what if it was to my benefit, would I wanna do that? You know, so which I have not been in that situation. So I can, I can understand that there might be a time when you're like, oh my goodness, we need to use this bill to, to pass this thing that just came up in front of us. You're um, like related to state government, rescind right? all crown lands. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? Well, that could lead us easily to talking to about HB 499. That's a whole nother, that's a whole nother. So that's the part is, I feel like, um, you know, with with these um, a pertinent rights. So we, we did a training recently, it was really wonderful. This is the part about meeting really incredible people. So we did a training with Kahuliao, Kapua Spro, um, Auntie Davy McGregor. Um, there was just so many people actually that came on and, and shared their manao um, and was really rich in terms of Hawaiian law, Native Hawaiian rights, um, public trust doctrine, um, all of these really, um, and uh, what is that, the, the traditional customary rights. Uh, while I don't have every piece of what act and what section of the constitution it, it refers to, um, the general idea, I absolutely understand. And, and to, to be in that training was just the, the beginning, you know, just like the skim of the surface. So those are the kinds of things that I feel like we're just getting warmed up 
and you know to continue to to learn more of those things and and to connect with the folks that were um, presenting you know big picture because that you know as we're as we're passing laws as we're reading through testimony um, you know I need to be able to reach out to folks in, ter in terms of asking them questions about different things so just kind of building that repertoire and um, and folks who also then see our work in our office and you know respect it and then know that they can reach out because they're like oh you know um she's our she's ally. done she's done good work on this in the past and you know she spoke to this so then hopefully they feel like they can reach out to our office and support um it was interesting because we we had experiences like so many wonderful the whole the whole session amazing amazing signs that came on the daily and kind of lifted our spirits, even though we were working, working like crazy. And sometimes you feel like, you know, uh, maybe, well, I never did lose hope because of those signs, put it that way. Um, but there would be something where, you know, be researching a, a resolution, you know, and it's on burials. So immediately I call somebody and then my staff called another person and ironically, they're both pointing to each other. Oh, we wrote that resolution. So then again, we were like, okay, well, at least we're on the right page in terms of who in the community to contact about this topic. Turns out they wrote the, the resolution, you know? And um, so just, you know, getting started with those things, but that was really special. Um, yeah, so. Awesome. So I'm sure just even like building up all those contacts. And um, so I would like to hear about last week, there was a special session, correct, for the um, confirmation of um, a Supreme Court justice for the state Supreme Court. We'd like to hear about that. It fortunately was um, not confirmed. But, Tell us more about that. Yeah. You know, wow. so um, so I knew that these judicial nominees were were coming up, and specifically one. Um, but we didn't know we didn't have um, the list of who made the final final list with the judicial selection committee. Uh, but once the governor made his selection, then we um, then the list was became available, and we saw you know who had received the nomination, and I started learning about it because. Um, you know, I did look on his um, resume and, you know, started kind of learning about him. I scheduled an appointment to have an interview with him. And then I start seeing things on um, social media and talking with my colleagues, uh, which was really important, even for me, because I have to say, because I'm a participant too in this whole systemic racism, that's not the first thing that came to my mind. I'll be completely honest. I was like, oh, right on. I'm looking... I, I didn't see the numbers in terms of, um, you know, what was presented in terms of how much experience they had, but I just assumed they all made the list, you know, and I wasn't looking at, um, I wasn't thinking of it in terms of um, systemic bias um, or gender inequality or race, anything related to that. Um, so I have to say, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm part of that, that learning curve also. Um, but immediately, as I start reading some of the commentaries from from folks in the in the academic community and also in the um, in the legal community that I really respect, everything made complete sense in terms of looking at th this the systemic bias that comes along with repeatedly um, kind of fast tracking a fast tracking of uh, folks based on you know the lesson that it teaches is it's who you rub elbows with rather than than who you are is, is one thing, you know, one way to, to look at it. And um, I know for myself, um, I, I, in, in meeting with the, the nominee, we're talking with all kinds of people about their experience with the nominee, wonderful person, right? So it became, not, again, it's not personal. It wasn't about the person necessarily. Maybe some of the things in question were, um, he was experienced enough to be on the list, but why are we going with the least experience and, and such? But other than that, so, you know, I had some really profound conversations around race and what it means to be anti-racist as opposed to just feeling like, oh, I'm not prejudiced. And, you know, having this mentality of 
you know, I feel like even as a progressive kind of progressive politics, like, you know, it's about, it's very easily to get into this thing of, you know, I'm here to do good and I know what's right and all of these things rather than to sit back and actually listen and recognize that there's, there's um, higher wisdom and there's a history and those two things can't be extracted from this situation, right? So the history is, is important and, um, you know, and, and everything that's happened since then is, is extremely valid in, in all of the choices we make in terms of appointments to higher positions. Um, and that can apply to my position as well. You know, I feel like, and I really truly feel like I'm a placeholder um, at this point. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's a completely different situation actually because um, legislator is supposed to be uh, uh, for the people, by the people and it's gonna have this diverse makeup, but I still do feel like I'm a, I'm a placeholder. And I'll, I'll, an opportunity, like our office is gonna um, be an opportunity for folks to come and learn the legislative process and you know, gain that experience that they, they may need and in order to you know, become the next leaders in our community. So, but yeah, so the, that was highly controversial, as you can imagine, you know, we, when we start talking about um, really sensitive subject of, of race and, and, and what this choice, um, the implications behind this choice, but really, you know, uh, racial bias is and, 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 and privilege and entitlement is embedded in every aspect of that, that vote. Um, yeah. So what, what I want to say is though the biggest, um, like the biggest, like heroes, I feel like in this whole past week and this whole process was the women of color who really came out and were able to speak because a lot of times, you know, again, with, with getting beaten down over and over or like, ah, no sense, you know, waste. Actually, I even heard that in other nominations, waste paper. Why should I even put my testimony in? They don't listen. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. And then especially if it, and that becomes normalized. I think um, Jamaica Osorio um, spoke to it, um, you know, pretty clearly um, when, you know, when in her, um, uh, some of her statements was, you know, it just becomes normal even for, even for, for everyone, for, for white people, for people of color, it just becomes normalized. And it's almost like a numbness because it's so normalized, right? And for, uh, for those women to come out and, and men, um, but there was a majority was women who were willing to risk their careers um, because you never know if now they're gonna have different um, uh, retaliations or, you know, maybe they won't right. get jobs because of things or, you know, different, different consequences that they may have. And nonetheless, they recognize that this was a pivotal moment and I think perhaps they recognize that a majority of the folks on the judicial selection, um, not the judiciary, on the judiciary um, committee also were in support, right? And so it kind of like built, it, it built, perhaps it built momentum, but it was really because of them. Mm. And, uh, so I just really want to send extra shout out to you know, folks who, who spoke truth to power in ways that I can't even repeat. But you know, when you really feel the depth of where all of that is coming from, even from 128 years ago or before, um, really powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can only imagine like there's those wins like that where maybe like democracy and fairness and justice, um, you know, prevails. But then I'm so curious of how it must have been to be there and watch the process with 499 with a house bill 499 and to hear the testimony the vast amount of testimony and all of this stuff and then for it to be like that mm -hmm. you know to go forward anyways and maybe one of the most monumental um yeah. mistakes and errors of recent times I would yep. maybe say maybe the last decade, maybe even longer, you know, as far as having like far reaching devastating impacts mm -hmm. in that move for social justice. 
Yeah. So that was the opposite. <laughs> right. right. The opposite. <laughs> right. Yeah. So this was really empowering. Um, and even within the Senate, I think, um, you know, amongst my colleagues, like really feeling, regardless of where people individually were at with, with the nomination, um, they really felt like this was a momentous occasion mm -hmm. to really be really clearly talking about racial prejudice, to be talking about entitlement, to talking about, but the, the interesting thing is, yes, with 499, it's all the same issues, but for some reason it was guised and folks weren't, you know, not recognizing perhaps, or maybe there was more at stake or people just didn't translate, you know, so clearly. Um, it's also possible that some of those conversations from 499, you know, also planted seeds to allow some of the next conversations about um, the nominee to, to percolate. Um, I won't, I cannot say that whether that is true or not, but it's very possible, right? We don't know because we really are in these changing times and we are in place, again, more, more, the more people speak truth to power, the more people feel empowered to continue to speak truth to power, right? And so, you know, that kind of just sets precedence, but yeah, it was super defeating 499. And the thing about, you know, there's so many things with 499, I guess one of the things that, you know, folk proponents were saying is like, we need to deal with these dilapidated buildings and looking at it like that's only one way to address a failing, situ a failing situation. And that rather than look at the mismanagement for years of either leasing at way below market rent or not being good, um, uh, you know, land managers, or in terms of taking some of that revenue and instead of taking it and putting it into the general fund to reinvest it back into the infrastructure of, of the place or the, the buildings or the, the land, you know, they're just saying, uh, you know, well, or because as managers, they didn't make folks stay accountable to their lease, then somehow miraculously, we should let them continue with their lease. Like not, you know, not looking at these things like. Right, yeah, like they dilapidate these, all, all of these places are totally dilapidated. So let's just give them another hundred years. Right, yeah, yeah, 45 years. Um, and so the interesting pieces to that is, you know, did anyone take into consideration and, and, and like really take true assessment on, are, would it be better for other people to come in? Are there better and higher uses for this public trust? Okay. And for example, with DHHL uh, or with um, Prince Cujillo, because that was one that kept coming up is that it was about Prince Cujillo, which is interesting because our office, when we were reading the bill initially, we're reading it and I'm like, it doesn't say DHHL land anywhere. It only refers to BLNR. So I started raising different questions and try to look, dig into it more and figure out, okay, wait, why is BLNR going to be then have have a say in what DHHL, Happen. what happens to DHHL lands. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting, right? They don't. So, right, but there may be a loophole, but then the other piece to the loophole is there's two contested case hearings perhaps then, right? DHHL and, and BLNR. But at any rate, um, yeah, it, it's the same, and it's also, it, and it, again, it's, it's based on this foundational thing that if I own it, or if I'm paid for it, then I'm entitled to more. Or like you have to, like, for example, we're looking at um, Prince Cujillo Shopping Center and he's Brookfield, same, um, same owners as, or lease, same company as Alamoana Shopping Center. Right. And, you know, ultimately if they, they just, they just re, um, acquired this lease, I believe 10 years ago. So how that switched hands is kind of an interesting question to look into as well. But if they have a 45 year extension, they, their, um, you know, their, uh, what is the word? Their portfolio is worth more, right? Because now they have, you know, if they were to sell it, they, they could sell it with a 45 year lease or something. Um, and so again, it comes back to that that um, that concept of land ownership that is 
is really not fundamentally based on the same value system as, as something that would take into consideration what is good for the public trust. So, but um, as I understand it, um, I think that that's part of the, I think, um, historic, historic um, mis misconception of the difference between DHHL lands and um, DLNR lands, mm -hmm. because one is a federal program right. established at which the state is a trust of it. They, they don't have no say what happens on DHHL. And the normal uh, practice of DHHL is to make it seem like this is just crown lands, right? We all know it's crown lands, mm -hmm. but in 1920, 21, mm -hmm. the pseudo, I don't even know what to call it, the guys who annexed Hawaii, decided to turn this into a state of the United States doing what they did. And all of a sudden they're saying in 1920, we're gonna take some of these crown lands and provide it for the native Hawaiians, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah. actually in a sense say that we're actually alienated from the rest of the crown lands. But by doing so as the United States did, as, as they did the federal government, the Congress did in 1920, it's not the same inventory. They are not to be misconstrued as the same as setting law, state law for the DLNR lands is different than setting law for the DHHL lands. Mm -hmm. And neither, neither the two, what is that? Neither the two shall, you know, shall be mis done that way anyway. There's a lot of stuff that to me, um, to me, um, as I watched 499, um, I did kind of like do a little bit of research and actually began from Bayfront. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it was because of the lands coming up, the Nani Loa, the hill, you know, all that land yep. that Drive was came up for a discussion because their lease was coming up. Reminds me of Pohaku Law, reminds yep. me of Abakea, you know, remind me of all these different lands that, you know, um, are crown lands and we were just in the discussion, like about, I say, a couple of years ago um, regarding climate change and, you know, the ocean, you know, swallowing up <laughs> our shorelines. And the discussion at that time regarding to Bay Banyan Drive was, what do we do about that? Because the hotels are right there. In fact, they're like, you know, they're like sea level, oh. you know? And it's like all the discussion just went down the tubes as soon as we came up with this bill brought in by Big Island, mm -hmm. 499 came up. I mean, it not came up at that time, but it kept on progressing to 499. But now it's involving all the leases of DLNR lands in a sense, including their, uh, I, if I, I'm not mistaken, all leases. Like even like Pohakuloa and all of that too. So that probably- well, Huh. Well, the thing is that DLNR lands to me is like you're talking ag, everybody. You're talking about influence the DLNR leases to be extended another 40 some odd years. And I'm saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. Because some well, of these people that are on those lands really are not really utilizing their lands the way that they're supposed to. And so it gets back to this whole thing about you know, the landlord not taking care of, you know, DLNR not taking care of, as I understand leasing, it's the, if you lease on 65 years, every so many years, you revisit the, you know, the, uh, the original lease and you come to an understanding that if the market value goes up, then we can negotiate that that time to change it. If they change the lease agreements on ag lots, you know, to go from 100, uh, an, uh, a lease to 480 and in 2021, then, you know, those changes occur during these revisits. I forget what they call it in, in re uh, realty terms, but, um, you know, there is these moments, these years, and, you know, how I know this is because of DHHL's annual report. Right. 
when these uh, lessee, leases have to come up and they go like during this year, 20 years, five years, 10 years, we're gonna be you know, looking at the lease again. How come we have to add on more years to that, to that practice? and or not being able to look at these people who are managing these properties and not making them accountable to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there's yeah. these things already that the realty people already do, that's already law. And yet, what, DLNR doesn't have to follow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the interesting thing is also they, in 499, they've created an exemption for lands managed under UH. Right, because otherwise that would have been a huge outrage because people would know that it's it's relating to Mauna Kea. Right. Meanwhile, though, there's a task force that's working on whether or not UH should remain the manager of Mauna Kea. Right. And so, right. if somehow that does change, then all of a sudden, this bill could apply to Mauna Kea because it would no longer be in the management of UH. Of UH right. But if if people oh. knew that, right? think about that, right? That's under question. Oh, so right? with this bill now, because only UH is exempted, if they determine UH should no longer be the manager, if they defer to any other state agency, it would automatically extend the lease. Good question. It could. <gasps> How are these sneaky guys? That's just one of those things. So, okay, and then you have, so I'm gonna, um, so going back to um, Waikia Kai Peninsula, Waikia Peninsula or Banyan Drive, right? Um, this revitalization thing, it, there's a history to it in terms of, I, I just, we're just learning a lot of the pieces, right? But um, I know folks in our community know a lot more of the details, but even if you just go back to Billy Kinoy's um, uh, administration, they put together um, Hawaii Banyan Drive revitalization, Right. Uh, anyway, I can't, can't remember the acronym, but basically yeah. a, a group of folks within the community, there was representation from many different folks within the community to kind of come up with a master plan and a bigger idea. And they were supposed to work hand in hand with the state. And then interestingly, last year during COVID, actually it was right towards the end when we, when we started opening up again, um, DLNR made the decision. Um, they, said, they said it was with the county um, but I, I have yet to find out who, but um, we're working on things like that. Um, to put out a request for proposal to renovate Uncle Billy's, um, rebuild, and, and then run it as a visitor accommodations. Um, and so they got three proposals, and one of which is, um, so, and then they ranked it, they had a, the BLNR, came up with a, um, a committee to assess the three that put in proposals and decide um, who would be, who would get the bid. And so, so far they still have to vote on it. And that vote I believe is coming up either at the end of August or the, now it looks like maybe the beginning of September. And I'll make sure that folks know because people in the community have been asking um, steadily for information about this because they have um, thoughts on it either way. And, um, and that the, the company that owns or that has, currently has the lease for Nani Loa is also the lead for getting the lease for BLN, for Uncle Billy's. Uncle Billy's and Country Club, which is um, not the one right next door, but the one beyond it, that currently houses people. And so a big question that might comes to my mind right off the bat is where are those housed people going to go and what's the plan for that? Of course, the reaction I get from folks most of the time um, within um, the department is that's not our that's not our kuleana. Like where that's they just need to leave. And for me, looking at the whole in terms of our housing crisis, um, and it's also so interestingly that the same company um, bought 164 plus units at Waikia Villas, and Waikia Villas has been receiving um, folks within Waikia Villas is tends to be a, um, a highly vulnerable population, whether it's kupuna on fixed income or disabled or veterans, um, single families that were previously homeless, um, folks on section eight, they've been receiving, even throughout the, um, the eviction moratorium, they were receiving 
texts from property management, as well as some received actual five day notice to vacate um, during, I think it was in June, could have been July, but it's during the moratorium um, to vacate the property. And that they've been, they were told um, that uh, their rent would be increasing from approximately 900 to 1400. They wouldn't be accepting section eight, like all kinds of things. And it was causing a lot of stress and pandemonium um, within the, the community that lives in Waikia Villas. Um, anyway, it just started bringing up a bigger picture issue of speculation, right. um, reno renovation, and I, I feel like, you know, you can relate, yeah, um, mm -hmm. where, where speculation, renovation, increasing the price, and it brings in a different clientele of renter, um, many of which, you know, it's often people working away from, you know, they can work away from home. Um, via the internet and so they're kind of doing like travel travel tourism work and um, at any rate that's not necessarily everyone but it just became it, it's bringing up these bigger conversations about how do we care for folks in our community and 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 where what do we need to do in order to make sure people remain housed that are housed and then also to you know create more affordable housing for folks that are currently unsheltered and that it is our kuleana so even if you know folks in the department are saying, well, that BLNR, our, our, our job is to manage the land and to put it to highest and best use. To me, I ask, well, how is highest and best use putting people out onto the street that are currently housed, right? And are there other highest and best use? Could it, could it be used for some other situation, not just visitor housing, um, visitor accommodation that is highest and best use? Those are just questions, right? Put to the yeah, community. it's like higher and best use for your profits for or what? for our community. Right. Yeah. So that becomes a really big question. Huge um, difference, right? And, yeah. And to address, um, Kumo, to address your thing was, is moving it back. Some folks think hey, it's okay to build a place, but we have to do it smart. We have to think about what, what does this look like in terms of our community needs. Um, and then move it back away from the shore, make the shoreline more open, which also does fit a cultural model of having more ocean access and open space. I'll, I'll, um, I wanted to mention H, no, it's SB 1166, which I believe became act, <clears throat> would be 222, I'm not 100% on the, the, the act, but it, what it does, and it, this was um, introduced um, at the same time as 499, it allows, lease rent exchange for infrastructure improvement or demolition. And one of the things that is involved in this Uncle Billy's piece is demolition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so let's say the bid is $10,000, which is currently what is being said that the demolition for Uncle Billy's would be 10, 10 million. Then it could allow for lease rent exchange $10 million. So that profit margin then goes to the, the developer and doesn't go to the state um, in terms of revenue that is, you know, most of the time the revenue just goes to their general funds anyway. And at this point, they spend a lot of that, I think, on, um, you know, watching kupuna dance on the alahulu kupuna. But, um, you know, so that would be least rent compensation, right? So not only a dollar a year, it actually might be zero because it's being it's being used to um, to demolition. Um, something as an environmentally conscious person, I bring up too is is how do we do demolition now? Like we right. really could take a lot of like if it's full of toilets, couldn't we use those to build small homes and on Hawaiian homelands? Like re reuse, recycle. Not that you know, or or for anything for for a shelter or for a community like a kauhale style community for. Um, currently unsheltered people we could do tiny homes there's a ton of or even just like regular people building house at a discounted totally. rate you know no, like totally. if you're building totally. here's some toilets right. that are for five dollars or something yeah, exactly. You know? exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Anything. For, yeah yeah in fact we our favorite store is the restore mm. that habitat for humanity and hilo it's yeah. the funnest in fact, and that's where we, we donate stuff to. So it's the same thing. So again, like there's no provision in there that says how this demo would happen and in what way when we're taking into consideration our landfill situation, right? And so again, I go back to these priorities, like governor has all these priorities 
you know, um, to eliminate homelessness, um, to create more um, agriculture, especially for local consumption, and, you know, to, you know, become more energy self-sufficient um, in terms of, uh, you know, off fossil fuels. So then I look at all of those priorities and I ask, does, does a development like that, for example, satisfy any of those priorities? And if not, this word of sustainability or regenerative tourism or anything just becomes a word, like a buzzword, unless we actually apply, um, you know, we, we look at every development or, or every project that we're working on with that lens. And if it doesn't satisfy those things, then it, it needs to be fit, changed. It yeah, needs it doesn't to fit the changed. model for the community. Um, yeah, so that'll be coming up soon. Um, and, oh, so, but within those stories, I have to say that even started thinking about because folks have shared different stories of their family, started realizing, okay, even go back before Billy Kinoy, and let's go to 1960, tsunami, mm -hmm. okay? There were people living there, yeah. there was a whole village living there, many of which are either still alive or related to folks, right? And then they got displaced and they were given, so far as I know, they were given the, the reason for safety. Ironically, right. a lot of them were moved to an inundation zone just a few miles down the road. They are also in the tsunami zone, even though right. they were moved because of safety. Right. And then within a few years, there's visitor accommodations being built, hotels. Mm -hmm. So it's like this conflict of, wait, wait, what's happening? Yeah, yeah that was dangerous for people. <laughs> it's yeah. only dangerous for Hawaiian families, but tourists yeah. is safe, yeah. Right? And so again, it just brings back into question all these things about public trust. And um, right. again, it brings back into the systemic racism and prejudice. And yes, mm -hmm. and where we're at now and where we're going. And again, speaking that truth to power and saying, wait a minute, no, it's not okay to come into a community, displace people, make a profit mm -hmm. and, and not seem to care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we forget the, um, that, like you said, that trust responsibility is Department of Land and Natural Resources. You know, and, and the resource over there, especially, you know, it's Mokuola. It's not yeah. what you see on top of the surface, it's what's underneath, you know? And maybe even turn it into some place like a marine science kind of area where you know, I mean, we have that wall. I mean, come on, we got to start talking about that wall there. That's, you know, I mean, how is it, is it, you know, I don't like swimming in, in Hilo Bay. I don't really encourage anybody to be paddling there, but that's all we got, you know. Mm -hmm. But what's going on with that wall and why, I mean, is it really there to stop a tsunami? Come on now. You know, and, and think the earth is shifting. The earth is definitely shifting. And that was one of my, my, my main concern was um, about the water rise, the ocean rising, because I've been to DHHL meetings and they're talking on the state level, um, like DHHL lands on Waimanalo Beach, Nanakuli, mm -hmm. you know, Keokaha, you know, the, the, they're already talking about moving Keokaha. I mean, I'm just saying everybody out there, we have to be maka'ala about all of these issues that are affecting us through our climates and stuff. And we, I'm saying, oh, what, are we, what are we doing? We're gonna build it up again. And then what? You know, I, I, just, I just think that we need to start listening mm -hmm. to our, you know, to our earth, you know, and, and really start being more observant of like how we were in the past very observant of all of our nature and getting in tune with it and stuff. And, and I think, you know, establishing that, you know, Hilo really is a place that our local people, our shorelines are used on a, I mean, you look at when we have 4th of July, when we have, you know, uh, holidays like that, that encourage everybody to be at the beach with their families, you know? Mm -hmm. And I go right around the corner and Banyan Drive. I mean, yeah, we need hotels and stuff like that, but maybe not well you know, we're looking into this not. regenerative tourism right 
Right. This idea of regenerative, that's even beyond sustainable. Sustainable yeah. is like where it's at right yeah. now, right? Yeah. But regenerative is like actually putting it, you know, regenerating it and bringing it back into this vibrant, you know, place. And, you know, there's many, there's examples throughout the world where they do something like a uh, tourist, a season, right? And you, you literally only have tourists for that season. And then the rest is reprieve. Um, where you put your life back together and it even though you know it, it's not mine to make their parallel but there's times you know with with Makahiki for example where you yeah. you know you go inward you fellowship you regenerate you you get re back ready for that time of action right yeah and not that the seasons have to go with that or anything because it, again it's not necessarily up for, for you know as, as a one person to decide but as a community to continue to look at what this regenerative thing really truly looks like Does yeah. it, you know is it extractive you know is it extracting so there's these these um mm -hmm. I, I come across all these different statistics all the time and i know for example one of them was about the visitors in in hana five thousand oh. to seven thousand per day, day. I day. Like that. per day, day. Per day. 5,000 to 7,000 per day? Yes. It's per day. day. Blow my mind. That's, that's oh. almost the amount of people that live on Molokai. Yes. <laughs> okay, so that is interesting. And then, and then there's numbers that come through. Like for us, um, what was it, 30? We're up to like 34 or 37,000 per day for the whole state of visitors coming in right now. And then I just think of, um, and then they mentioned, and then I saw some other statistic recently. I, I believe it was 5.4 million. They were talking about how much money came in. I think this was relating to Maui. $5.4 million in a, in a month, I think it was a month's time um, for coming into Maui. Isn't that great for our local economy? And I'm thinking, right. how do we know? Because maybe it went to Marriott. Maybe it went to Avis rental car. Right. And again, there is a, there's this idea that it trickles down and you know people do need jobs but a majority of the jobs are low paying and when you when you take a number like 5.4 million and you throw it out like this is how much um maui receives i really I start to question yeah i question wait, who received it how where did it go did it go to an off-island um investment mm -hmm. or or we really true and again so that regenerative piece really helps you know it, it's a design that is circular and that would go back literally into our economy into mm -hmm. everyone that lives here um you know and and is invested in the community um right you know in a way that's different than again doesn't make i mean yeah yeah anyway so, that, that money guaranteed is not going and like how out of that what really is coming in how much of that um, could be made in such a better way? At what extent, yeah, at what expense was that small amount that actually trickles down? Right. Yeah. You factor in the- and, and how much rubbish was created, right? That's right. So that doesn't factor in the cost to our community. So the damage another... to the roads, the damage to the trees, yeah. the damage to the use of electricity and like burning all of that, even just the carbon well, well, footprint. Look at Hanauma Bay as an example. You know, yeah. yeah, people pay and they don't care that they pay. And yet they have hundreds of visitors there every single day that now they have to stop and they have to go, wait, 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 we can only let so many use it at a time because it's starting to really just in a, a week, a month, that places like can't handle it. They can't handle yeah. So, so how are we taking care of that, you know? Yeah. Um, if anything, like community-based models, you know, really small community-based right. models right. really have to be the driver to this. And I, I think even to um, Maui calling for a moratorium on, on visitor accommodations and luxury accommodations, I think that was, you know, Maui County Council is really leading the way in a lot of these kind of um, bold conversations and making decisions around it. Um, because they're really saying, no, we value our keeping our people housed 
when we're having an emergency crisis. So here's how we address it. We address it by not continuing to prioritize the visitor. We, continue, we're, we want to also prioritize our, our community. And so these you know, smaller models of, of um, stewardship really become, you know, become the deciding factor of, of what happens in a place. Right. And, um, yeah. The thing is, is that when you look at the infrastructure, mm -hmm. they're stopping on the side of the road to take pictures. And the people that's going to work can't get past the traffic. You know, it's, it's all relative. Yeah. So, you no, know, Maui really has to kind of like, or all the islands, you gotta, we got to think about how infrastructure plays in this thing called tourism now. It's not so easy to just say we're going back to the, the normal or something like it's it's not gonna work now. You know, it's not gonna work. So you yeah. guys got so, ahead of you, you know, yeah. next sessions, you know. Yeah. So does your position come up next year or the following year? So 20 um the so it comes up in twenty twenty two. In fact, here's a good everybody thing for everyone to know. Everybody yeah. is up for re-election. The entire right. legislative branch uh -huh. in the Which state means, level. Is that we need to get some really awesome people running, right? Yeah. And there are, we know there are, so that's great. Um, but it's an opportunity. It's really an opportunity because every single position is open, um, including, and so including House uh, Senate District 1. And I will be running. Um, I'm just putting together some of my basic campaigns. So if folks want to jump in and, um, <laughs> you know, help spearhead some of the organization, I'm, I'm really happy to connect with, with folks. Um, and if Kilo gives me permission to serve again, then I'll be, you know, <clears throat> I'll be elected on um, August 6th. I believe it's the 6th. It's the Saturday in August or Saturday. Right. Because okay. it would be a primary, assuming that, assuming that it would be all Democrats. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> which we can't assume, you know, there's some other good parties. In fact, if we can get some Aloha, even one Aloha Aina representative and one Aloha Aina party in the Senate, would be really amazing because that they um, then have an advantage, like similar to Senator Favela being the sole Republican, he's on every single um, committee. Wow. So, you know, oh. and so because he's the only representative from that, that party. party. That party? I didn't know that. So we were just talking about that today. If, we, if there's even one Aloha Aina party that gets elected, um, they would be on They're every, on, single, every yeah. single committee and, you know, they have to have their own caucus room and they might just Ooh. caucus with their staff, but, you know. Would you yeah. consider running under Aloha Aina? No, I, I'm, I'm definitely um, a Democrat Demo through and through. Um, although I have to say that not all Democrats and not all people with the D are necessarily Democrats. Right. Um, and yeah, it's, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Democrat, so I'm gonna stay a Democrat. But I definitely um, can understand the platform of Aloha enough 100%. And I feel like for myself, that's where um, I wanna to continue to make all decisions that I make as a Democrat based on my, of course, my understanding and what I hear from testimony based on Aloha Aina. Mm -hmm. Because that's all we have, <laughs> ultimately. What else yeah. do we have? We'll, if we continue to extract, we don't have, you know, we don't have. Um, those resources. So. Ooh, yeah, so big it's, it's gonna, job. It's going to be a big year. Mm -hmm, yeah. Big year. Yeah, Laura, we're so grateful. So Thank grateful you. to you and just yeah. really mahalo you for the work you've done. And I, for the work, I know that we can depend on you to continue doing. And that is just huge. So mahalo, mahalo. I yeah. know that this, I'm sure this has been at a great, your work has been at a great sacrifice to your ohana and your keiki, which are still, you know, living with you and raising your children yeah. and going through this journey of, um, you know, really working for the lahui and it's, it's awesome. And we mahalo you yeah. so much. And we would love to have you again soon sometime okay. and just get yeah. the next. Oh, yeah get the next update of um you know how's it going especially we'd invite you to anytime there's something going on you really feel that the public needs to be informed to um you know okay. utilize this platform as much oh as that's wonderful yes. yes 
Yeah, and that's another thing is um, testimony is really important because that's where we really gain a bigger understanding. So again, just um, I think people know, but don't be shy about giving testimony because I mean, so long as it's culturally appropriate to the person, of course, but um, if can, please, please give it because we learn a lot through testimony. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, it's really important. So yeah. yeah, but that's wonderful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate being here. I, I really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a lot to learn and it'll be um it'll be wonderful at if nothing else to try to get together before session because we can give some heads up as to what what might be expected i mean i expect a repeal of uh an attempt to repeal 499 mm -hmm. right so yeah and yes. and and other other aspects that would really um kind of uh, dovetail with those kinds of concepts Mm -hmm. and, and all the things that we've been talking about tonight, really. Yeah. And including um, amendments to the midwifery um, bill that happened in 2019, 2019 as well. So. All well, kinds well, of guys. exciting <laughs> times. So, so mahalo you, Laura. Mahalo Nui. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mahalo okay. to you both. Mahalo to your staff as well. Yes. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> your car. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Ahoy ho. All right, that's it. Ahoy ho. Ahoy ho.